for all you ground uppers out there, this podcast is for you. Hey guys, this is the Fan of Fan podcast. I'm Ben. And I'm Topless. And for all you ground uppers out there, this podcast is for you. And it's the finale at long, long last. We're joined by York City fan and Hallam FC kit man, Ian. How are you, mate? Good evening, guys. Yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. And thank you for thank coming, you. mate. Yeah, it's great to finally, finally finish this season. And hopefully we're going to have an absolute cracker in finishing it. It's going to be a season finale. Oh, I hope so. I've got some, I've got some, uh, I've got some belters for you, definitely. Fantastic. Well, as soon as we got that message, we had to make sure we got you on. We might even have to have a part two at this point. <laughs> oh, honestly, I think I, I, I sent a few messages out to a few of the few of the lads who used to knock about with at York. I went, lads, can we have a good think about all the crazy stuff and all the stupid stories that have happened over the last ten years? Um, and I'm still getting the text coming through, and I've got a little notebook here. I'm genuinely, I'm running out, I'm running out of room. Just like oh, I, 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 half of them, like I can't even remember that even happening, probably because I was in an alcohol fueled comatose state. And then there's somewhere I, I, I genuinely somehow forgot that it happened. Um, so I've been sat here for the past, like the past half hour, just laughing at some of these texts come through. I'm just <laughs> counting that. I, honestly, it's just bonkers. So let's, let's go back to the start then. How did, how did you get into football? Where did it start for you? Um, so a love of football comes through my, uh, through my whole family, really. Um, I wasn't blessed with good sides, obviously. Um, my dad's side of the family are York fans and my mum's side are Rotherham <clears> fans, <throat> so I never really had much of a chance, to be honest. Um, but obviously, growing up in York, um, obviously went to watch York, and thankfully didn't go watch Rotherham. Um, so went with my dad, uh, started going occasionally from about the age of 9, 10, and then had a season ticket with my dad in the pop stand from about... 2004 for a few years and then once I got a little bit older I told me dad I wanted to stand on the terraces so we moved over to a uh, David Longhurst stand and we were on there for well my dad, well, my dad was still there until they knocked it down but I think uh, I was there for about another eight years season ticket holder so yeah that's that was my introduction to football really and the first game I remember was a uh, an enthralling nil-nil draw against Rushton and Diamonds so um, where, where do we even begin? It was probably one of the worst games ever. But I remember that York had just signed a Brazilian, so therefore I was very much intrigued. I remember he came on and had one shot which cleared the longest, but I was like, this guy's brilliant. I want to see more of him. <laughs> so, yeah, back back again next week. I think we got I think we got turned over 3-0 by... Uh, I think another team that's gone bust. I can't remember now. I'm sure looking back, I'll have a look at some of the fixtures earlier. I was thinking half these teams have gone bust. Uh, but yeah, I think the first two games we didn't score a goal. So yeah, the the, the uh, they, it, it worked a charm. Well, things could only certainly get better from there. You can certainly say <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. A ground up, a ground up is nightmare, and nil nil draw is your first game, eh? I know, I know, and I, st- and I stayed there, stayed there pretty much until they knocked the damn thing down. So yeah, but no, I, I loved, I, I loved going to Brood and Crescent. And full enough, when you asked me to come on, I was having a think. And a few weeks ago, I ended up finding myself sat on the sofa just watching old videos from Brood and Crescent. And um, obviously now, now my relationship with York's changed. I'm involved with Hallam, and I live in Sheffield. I didn't realize how much I missed it until I saw some of the goals and seen some highlights and. Like just just this evening, I was. I'm sure there was a pretty. I'm sure there was a, a long penalty shootout, which was a UK record at the time. And uh, lo and behold, there was. It was in an FA Trophy game between York and Kidderminster, and York won 13-12 on on penalties. I remember missing the. Uh, we, we missed the last bus home because it was a 7:45 kickoff that went to extra time, and then we had about a 40 minute penalty shootout. And it, it I think it was it was well well gone 11 o'clock by the time I'd left Bruton Crescent. <clears throat> And just I've just been sat here smiling, and you'd realize if you realize how much you miss it. You know, I don't think you really know how much you miss it until it's gone. Um, you know, football fans around here are, are, are quite well stocked with with clubs, but not many of them have changed the grounds. Um, and it's just it's it's just so strange, really, thinking that the ground that you know 
I got accustomed to footballing and fell in love with the sport isn't there anymore. Uh, which is a little bit sad, but I've got plenty of memories from it. But yeah, I think that's probably why I, I don't. It's one of the other one of the other reasons, as well as helping Haaland, why I don't why I don't watch him as much because I think realistically, deep down, I know the football club that I grew up watching and, and loved and well idolised. It just isn't there anymore, unfortunately, to a certain extent. Uh, I keep going back, wanting it to be like it was, but it's never going to be what it was. Uh, I think times changed, and I think I need to just move with the times and just accept it that that version of York City doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. I mean, back then, I guess they'd have been in the Football League as well. Um, funnily enough, my first year as a season ticket holder was the year we got relegated out of what was the old Division Three and yeah. into the Nationwide Conference. So I actually grew up on non-league football. Okay. So from 2004 to 2011, 12, it was eight years of, of conference football and playing in amazing competitions like the Satanta Shield, um, which to be fair, I'd be surprised if you've ever even heard of it. I think it lasted yeah. for about two, I think it lasted for about two seasons. And I think we had a high attendance of about 486 once. So it was really, really well, uh, really well supported. But no, I grew up on it. And for me, that was, it was my Premier League. It was what I was used to. I'm sure obviously being, you know, United fans or Wednesday fans, like your team is, for you, there's, you know, it is the pinnacle and, you know, your stand, your stand's the best, your ground's the best, your team's the best. And you don't really, until you get older, you don't really go, actually, hang on a minute, we're not really the best. And there's bigger grounds and there's bigger clubs and there's, mo- there's well-supported clubs and these players are better than our players. But at that time, you know, when you tend to, 16, 17, 18, like it's, you have got the best club and you just absolutely idolise everything about it. And even though we we're in the National League or the Conference or whatever you want to call it, it was just, it was just the best. It was just so addictive. For me, it was like match of the day. It was like supporting a Premier League club. Um, I never had any interest in any other Premier League club. Growing up in York, every man and his dog's pretty much a Leeds fan, but I couldn't give two shits about what Leeds were doing. I couldn't care less. Uh, honestly, I could not care less what they do. Um, all my mates were Leeds fans, or Man United fans, typical. Uh, I think out of out of our whole year at school, we had two two York fans out of about three four hundred lads. It <laughs> said it all really. Um, but to me, they were Man United, um, and I just absolutely loved it. Uh, and even though it was non league football, you know, some great grounds, some big crowds, just like you see now with obviously Chesterfield and Wrexham and County getting ridiculous attendances um, they're bigger than what they were when we were in the conference the first time round uh, but still there's some massive clubs massive clubs the year we got the year we went up uh, well we beat Luton in the playoff final obviously Wrexham who were still down there remarkably uh, Cambridge United were in the, in the division that year Stockport County uh, there's a reoccurring theme that all these clubs have got gone on to bigger and better things and York have seemed to have either go down or further down, um, but yeah, to, to me, like that non-league football, I didn't even really see it as non-league football because it was just, it was the best. It was football, and it was my team. Definitely, wow. <laughs> and that that's the sort of thing. Once you get that connection with a club, it's it can be fantastic, especially when you get all the highs. But you've got to take the loads with it. Um, oh yeah, and oh, there, was, there was plenty of lows in that first eight eight <laughs> years of being in a being in the conference. Um, yeah, just I, I, I remember when Billy McEwen got sacked. I genuinely thought that that was the end of life, really, because uh, <laughs> I think he was the first football manager who I really I was obviously of that age where before and I didn't really know managers and I didn't really know players apart from a few of them. Um, but I'd say Billy McEwen was the first manager who, well, to be fair, you could even say I idolised him because I really did. I, I loved his, I loved his team. I loved his tactics. We we were just so attacking. We just went out to score goals. So a bit, a bit like a uh, bit like an old Newcastle side that ironically never won anything either. Um, but you know we, we'd win games four three five two three two or draw three three. We'd be three 0 down and get a point at three three. Um, and we just signed attacking players. You know, we got a young Clayton Donaldson who just scored for fun. 
Um, you know, him and Andy Bishop up front, who went on to play in the Football League and had a, had a fantastic career after leaving York. Then to up front, scored a ridiculous, I think they scored like 60 odd goals in a season. I don't think any other York strike partnership has done it since. To be fair, I don't think many clubs have a strike partnership that gets 60 odd goals in a season. Um, so there was, but you know, like you say, yeah, there was plenty, of, there was plenty of rubbish times during during that eight years. You know, we had we had tough seasons where even then we looked like we could almost get relegated into the Conference North. Frankly, it never really happened. Obviously, it did happen. It did happen later on in later on down the line. But even back then, um, you know, we had some poor seasons where you could say we're transitioning from manager to the next, or we hadn't quite made it in the playoffs. And then you always have that bit of a depressed season the year after where. You know, just things don't go right. You have a you have a good season in that that division. Some of your players get nicked by League Two teams, League One teams, and you're trying to rebuild again. Um, but even even the lows, I never once thought about stop going or go with somebody else. Um, you know, and no matter how bad our players were, to me, they were still world beaters. That that's one thing, especially at this sort of level as well, is a lot of the fans do seem to be loyal. Like I, I've I've just been catching up on the um, Arsenal documentary, the Netflix, Netflix series, the Amazon Prime series, and it's the one where they started off, they lost the first three games, and they're already getting um, well, be behind um, Arteta saying you need to be sacked. This and other, it's the worst season ever. It's the worst Arsenal team ever, but. They don't actually realise how sort of fortunate they are. How oh, no. What's competing at a certain level year in, year out and not having the difficulties or the financial difficulties what a lot of teams experience. Yeah, absolutely. I remember. We're going to finish fifth. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But even even to a lesser extent, I remember when, obviously, I've grown up in, in Sheffield for the last uh, 10 plus years, and, you know, well, obviously both clubs have been in League One uh, at some point during that period. And it's like, oh, my God, it's an absolute disaster. We have to go to Oxford away. You know what I mean? Like, oh, Oxford. Oh, we have to go to Milton Keynes, which, well, Milton Keynes is a bad example because I'd rather go to... I'd rather, I'd rather go to Baghdad than Milton Keynes. But, you know, like, York have played Farsley Celtic away on a Tuesday. And I'm like... Can you don't even realize you don't you don't even know where half these places are when you start a season. At least everybody, at least with you know you're with United on Wednesday, they're still playing, you know, run of the mill football league teams that were established. And York are getting turned over by the Dog and Duck. We got beat by Haven and Waterlooville one year at home. I have to, honestly, it was that bad that we had a striker called Paul Brayson who came on in the first half and got substituted early in the second half. Some say it was an injury. I just say it was dreadful. But at least the match sponsors had the balls to vote in man of the match because it was it was the highlight of the game where poor old uh, poor old stadium announcer goes on today's uh, match sponsor man of the match is Paul Brayson and everyone just bursts out laughing. It's just you you just don't get that anywhere else because obviously you've usually got Gary Neville picking man of the match. But um, <laughs> when you've got when you've got some uh, when you've got some sarcastic match sponsors who just don't care, then it's it's brilliant. Um, oh, getting flashbacks to that game now. I was a ball boy at the way end, and it was so cold. I've never I've never been so bored in my entire life. Oh, uh, I think was that was that before or after? I think we'd we'd beaten Russia Olympic six one in the in the qualifying round before, and where Craig Farrell, who's sadly passed away. Uh, recently, he scored a scored a second half substitute hat trick and got player of the round. And the, I think he's, I think they still do it now, where the player of the round gets invited to the final. I think you get I think you get like tickets for you and your family to go to the final. So yeah, we'd we'd beaten Russia Olympic. I couldn't even once again. I don't even know where Russia Olympic even is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Um, <laughs> somewhere around there, probably. Yeah, yeah. and then. And then we get and then we got dumped out by the mighty Haven and Waterlooville. I think that was the year that they went on to uh take the lead at Anfield, if I remember rightly. Wow. So uh <laughs> what could have been, eh? What could have been? Yeah. What could have been indeed. Oh, honestly. But yeah, there's 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 so many good times and, and uh, 
just just I'm just looking through my list and just yeah just things which I think only could happen to York. Like I just don't think I've ever heard them happen to any other club. You know, like during that period of when we were first in, in the conference, you know, just some of the stories were just you'd look round going, is this really happening to us? Like I never hear this happening to any other football club. We had a striker called uh Onami Soji, who is related to Effie, Sam and Akpo uh Soji in some way, shape or form. Don't ask me out because I don't know the family tree. Um, but whilst playing for York, we found out that in, he was technically an illegal immigrant and he had no visa, no passport, nothing. So York, obviously, because he was our star striker at the time, spent five grand in lawyers. We even got the Archbishop of York, John Sentimu, to back his bid to stay in the country. We got all his paperwork sorted Turn down a contract signed for Barnsley. <laughs> it's just, and, you, and you sat there going, this doesn't happen to anybody else. Like it, I'm like, sat, you, you sat at home, you're going, it just, why is it always us? Like it just, it's always us. And I think that was the same season where Martin Foyle, a fantastic manager, well, say fantastic manager, a fantastic manager who had the most well drilled, well drilled four four two you've ever seen. It was Plan B was four four two and Plan C was four four two, and um, he got us to the playoff final against Oxford. Chris Wilder's Oxford, who absolutely demolished us, to be honest. But the uh, the year after, once again, bit of a bit of a uh, a bad start. Foyle gets tic tac He's he's uh he's been given his marching orders. His assistant takes over, and we had a little bit of a of a surge. And at the start of the next season, and I, I can and honestly, this did happen because uh one of me one of my mates, Michael Lingham, obviously was goalkeeper at York for many many years. Um, told me after he left, obviously, um, that <laughs> on the first day of pre season of the following season, so Colin Walker is now a manager. They're all there on the training field. All the first year pros are there. New signings are there. And he's gone. What's that over there, lads? And everyone's like, there's nothing there, Gaffer. It's just fields. He went, no, no, you're not looking properly. And everyone's like looking around thinking, oh, what's, he, what's he saying? And he went, over there is a platform, a train platform. And everyone's like, he's lost it. He's genuinely lost it. Where's he going with this? And he's gone. That is the platform to promotion. Are you coming on the train with me? And all the players are like, does he want us to go stand on his imaginary platform? So Colin Walker has walked off into the distance and he stood on this imaginary platform and all the senior pros are like, saints at young lads, go over there. You go join him over there. So one of them's gone, sorry, I'll go stand over here. So he's gone and stood over there. And lo and behold, he's gone, fantastic, that's the attitude I'm looking for. So all the players are like, right, let's go stand on his imaginary platform. And that was the start of, that was the first session of pre-season that year. And lo and behold, he was sacked by Christmas, so that says everything, doesn't it, really? <laughs> so if you ever become football managers, don't, just don't use imaginary train platforms in any of your pre-season training, any of your team talks. Oh, indeed, any situation <clears throat> Think of to be honest. I have to cross that off my list now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I just, but once, once again, I think it might have been. Uh, forgive me for wrong. I forgot which pre-season it was, but I was in Amsterdam on a lovely holiday, and I got a text: four York players arrested. I'm like, oh, like what could possibly? Uh, what fantastic! Um, so they had they played Halifax who I think, they were, what, FC Halifax, they were coming back through the leagues again. So they, were, they weren't in the conference at the time. I think they were in the conference north or slightly below. They might have been in the North Premier League, something like that. And we played them in pre-season and we'd been beat 3-0. We'd had a player sent off. So who gets a player sent off in pre-season? Like it has, you, you have to pretty much kill someone to get sent off in pre-season. I've only ever seen it twice. <laughs> um and I got this, I got this text. Obviously, I've seen the result the night before. Um, out the next day, I get a text saying, Yeah, four York players arrested. And you're like, What could have possibly gone on? 
And once again, the articles are out there, so you're more than happy to uh, call me out if you think I'm wrong. But um, lads have had a team bonding session after being absolutely licked 3-0 by part-time Halifax. Seems like a great idea. Um, They've gone out, the night's finished, and four players are standing in a subway wanting to get some food. Well, so one of the um, first-year pros from the previous season who has been released, who um, had a bit of a mouth on him, decides to walk in and start chirping at one of the wingers that we've just signed, saying, can't believe they've released me, I'm better than you, this, that and the other. Lots of expletives being used. And our brand new winger that we've just signed decided to beat the living life out of him. Oh, in some way. <laughs> um, so the other, the other three players uh, got arrested as well. But well, well, mainly because they didn't run away from the scene of the crime, although they had nothing to do with it. Uh, yeah. And said said player, if you've ever been to York, um, you'll know that you can hire those little red boats on the River Ouse. So okay. you and your, you and your missus can get in one half yeah. an hour, drive down, drive, sail down the River Ouse and come back again. So in his in his pissed up wisdom has gone. Well, coppers aren't nicking me. So he runs down to the River Rose and proceeds to try and steal one of the red tourist boats. And once again, I just I don't see this happening to I don't see this happening to Chesterfield. I don't see it happening to Knox County. Why is it always us? It just everything, <laughs> just it's story after story. And you're like, how on earth do we sign these idiots? And why is it always us? But no, there was there was there was so many good times in that first period. So many good times as well. Oh, obviously winning, winning at Wembley twice in eight days, isn't bad. Not many clubs can say that. Not many clubs can say they've even been to Wembley twice in eight days. Never mind won it. <laughs> yeah. no. No. I believe Rotherham would be it. Were it last season or the season before? They went to. Wembley twice was it within eight days? I don't think, but uh, oh, did when... they go for the did they go for the football league trophy and then the, did they go for a playoff as well or something like that? No, they went remember. to automatically. Rotherham did, but they don't want. I thought they, oh, they did when they went for the playoffs and for the Papa John's. I, I don't know if that's the uh, Shrewsbury season, yeah, where Richard would score twice. I, I don't know if it were then, but did um, they, they, they went once last season trophy last year. Yeah, they won it last year, but they went to automatically, didn't they? Against Gillingham away. They did that go up against Gillingham, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. It might have been that year they won uh Richard Wood, the beat Shrewsbury in the par five. It might have been there, I can't yeah. remember. Really. <clears throat> well, York York for a, for a club of their size and at the level they play at have been a ridiculous amount of times. They went in 2009 and lost. 2010 <laughs> and lost. Twice in 2012 and won. And then we won again in 16, 17. So we've got yes. one, two, one, two FA trophies and then uh, and won one playoff. So we've been five times since the new Wembley's been up, which I don't even think, well, I don't think even half the Premier League have even been that many times. Everton certainly haven't, have they? Let's be honest. <laughs> Unless you're spare. Yeah, Liverpool you're have. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, uh, yeah, it's this. <laughs> Just, I just need to tick off some of these stories. We've done, we've done the Colin Walker platform. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> players' night on when Craig Nilthorpe got arrested. Uh, keep going, yeah. let's go. Get rid of them off. Oh, <laughs> honestly, I'm just I'm just looking at Sodgy with his contract. Um, yeah, FA Trophy game with the 13-12 penalties. Um, that I think I think they are the, the they're the ones that stand out from before we were got back into. The football league looking at my list um well even actually no to be fair before we got promoted we had some fa- talking about cup games and um and that we had some fantastic fa cup games as a non-league club the first time around where we took i think we took five thousand to stoke one year and then five thousand to bolton the year after we got to the third round twice in twice in consecutive years i think or twice in three years I think the Stoke one came first, and that was just once again tip up, typical York City. Took the lead, Chris Carruthers, um, and then thirty-seven seconds later, it's one-one through possibly one of the greatest own goals you'll ever see. Um, it was like a, a classic Rory Delap, Rory Delap long throw, 
and doing that to non-league footballers just isn't fair. Um, didn't know which way to stand, which way to look, which way to think. Um, and lo and behold, Rory Delap, long throw comes in and Danny Parslow, God rest his soul, absolutely shanks it top corner from about six yards out, unmarked, just absolutely rods it top corner. And then um, they went on to win 3-1. But a good day out, great day out. I think uh, who scored the other ones for Stoke that day? Little winger. Math- Matthew Etherington, that ring a bell. Did he play for Stoke? Yeah. yeah. yeah I think I think it must have been him. And then a the year after... Um, <laughs> the year after we went to Bolton, it might have been the year after that, I can't remember. And it was, I think it was Bolton's last year in the Premier League before they went a bit peaked on. Um, and there was a very young right back, I think they were playing right back that day, on loan from Real Madrid called Marcus Alonso. And York tore him to pieces, got got hooked at half time. Everyone went, he won't make out him. And lo and behold, he's uh, he's done much to the right himself, I think. Done better than any of us three, Jesus. Um, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget or forgive Neil Barrett, who missed two absolute sitters in the second half, and it was nil nil. And then uh, I think it must have been Owen Coyle, who was manager at the time, when this is getting a bit too close for comfort. So I brought Kevin Davis and Johan Elmander on, who both got a goal each, and there you go, got got bumped two nil. But um, once again, I think we took might have even been six thousand to Bolton, but. Um, just fantastic away days. And for a club of our size, when you can take that many, especially when our average, well, our home average about then was probably about two eight, two nine, maybe. I don't even think we were getting three thousand. So to to take double your usual uh home attendance was uh was was pretty special. Um I don't think they've made <laughs> I don't think they've made first round many times after that though. We've seemed to uh we seem to have had a bit of bad luck in terms of FA FA Cup. We got beat by Buxton last year, so how they might have fallen. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm just trying to rattle them off here. I, I, I loved I loved some of your questions because as soon as it says, "What's the worst ground you've been to?" Luton. I have to be fair, the answer to half of your questions, the, the answer to half of your questions is Luton. Worst atmosphere, Luton. Worst ground, Luton. Worst people, Luton. Worst club, Luton. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I mean, Gary was telling me there seems to be a history with York and Luton fans. Well, What's your thoughts on it. Well, there is, and it's completely concocted in the minds of Luton fans because they are the angriest aggressive fan base towards their own players and their own club and anyone who looks at them with two eyes, really. Um, they're just... Uh, it's a backward football club for a backward town, to be perfectly honest. They're a strange breed of people. Uh, and it all came about from... We had a few We had a few games with them where... There were a bit of niggle on the pitch. I remember... I need to remember which seasons they were in now. Um, we got them in the playoff semi-finals the year we lost to Oxford. So it would have been 2009-10. And to be fair, it's one reason why I should probably not really have... Well, I know they're bringing in safe standing, but it's probably... I'm always an advocate for terraces, but when York scored a last-minute winner against Luton, my shoes were near the top of the longest and I was at the bottom. Um and I can't, well, I just can't remember. It was, it, it was just, we, you just ended up surfing over people. It was absolute bedlam. Uh, so we beat them 1 0. Uh, we beat them 1 0 in the playoff semi final home leg at, at Bootham Crescent. And then we went to Kenilworth Road um, and drew 1 1. Um, I want to say Chris Carruthers scored for York. Sounds about right. Um, and that is one of the only games where the York Press gave out a ten, a, 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 a ten in their uh, play ratings for Dave McGurk's last last minute game saving tackle. Uh, so York obviously drew one one on the day, one two one, and there was just an undertone of anger and aggression and nastiness from Luton fans all day. And to be fair, for most of the game, it weren't even aimed at us. They were aiming at themselves, at the wrong players. Um, but so, as soon as the final whistle, as soon as the final whistle finished, Luton fans invaded the pitch, and obviously, lo and behold, came straight for York fans. And a little bit of miscommunication from stewards. Stewards weren't letting York fans out at the back of the stand, uh, which they probably should have done. 
Uh, Luton fans are trying to get in at the front of the stand. So lo and behold, all chaos ensues. And um, I know we all we all like to give uh, coppers a good kick in when it comes to football, but the coppers that day did a fantastic job, to be honest, of keeping Luton and York fans apart. Because if they'd have got into that stand, then they'd have been, well, I, I, I think someone would have been seriously, seriously injured. Um, Luton fans then decided to, well, say fans, it's a small minority, but I'd say their small minority is bigger than most, um, decided to take one of their own walls down in their main stand and start throwing bricks at us, uh, which is quite nice of them. Um, shower of coins, food, seats, anything that could really get their hands on, shoes, corner flags coming in like javelins. Um, and they come on the pitch so fast and the, the stewards and the police just couldn't get them back. They'd actually blocked off the um, players' tunnel. So the York players were actually hiding in the back of the away end with us and were just getting peppered with coins. And Sky Sports News have it all. You can see it all on YouTube still. Sky Sports News were going across the Kenilworth Road because York fans are getting, getting a kick in by every single little man and his dog. And there was a, there's, there's a bit of Richard Brody, who was our star striker at the time, with his shirt over his head in the back of the stand, trying to make an exit, trying to run down the back of the stand and get through this fire escape to get back down into the main stand, to get back into the, uh, to get back into the, the, uh, the players' changing rooms. Um, and it all came from that, you know, like there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fair few teams between York and Luton. Um, and we never really had much of a rivalry with them until that. And it all got a bit tasty and a bit interesting. Every single away game with them after that um, was was minimal tickets. Because the first time like, in, that, in that time, York City supporters bus, every window got put through. Um Typical behaviour. But then again, that, that day in particular, as soon as York fans had left, Luton fans started just going down Luton High Street and just smashing up people's shops. So there's just no sense, no feeling. They're just, they're just a very strange club. Um, very, very strange. And I think their, their owner at the time, I don't know if he still is, uh, Nick Owen, used to work in TV. I don't know. I'm too young to know. Um he came out and went, oh yeah, well no, it's all been it's all been over egged. It wasn't that bad. Then Sky Sports have gone. Well, you should probably you should probably see this footage that we've just uh, blasted around nationwide. Then pal, and lo and behold, he comes out after that and went, oh yeah, it's pretty bad, that isn't it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty bad, mate. Yeah. Um. So it all came from that. Uh. And then I think let me just get my years right. So that'd have been that'd have been nine ten. So ten eleven. Um. Gary Mills came in. Uh, revolutionised the way that we played and it kind of went back to the old Billy McEwen days of playing fantastic football, quick attacking football and just scoring as many goals as you could and not really caring about how many you're letting at the back. Uh, we played them at home just in a league game. I think Luton were always near the top of the table when when we were in the conference and just had a spectacular way of never going up really, just completely self-imploding. Pretty much like the fan base to be honest. Um, and we played them at home and I think we won 1-0 or 2-0. Um, Scott Kerr, we signed from Lincoln City, came on and probably should have been sent off with the tackle that he made. Uh, referees are probably giving him a red card now, to be honest, it is like 10 years ago. Um, it was a it was an industrial challenge, shall we say. Um, and referees giving a yellow card. And Gary Brabin, the manager of Luton at the time, for some weird reason, took his uh, took his issues out with the York bench over a referee's decision, claiming that they'd somehow influenced it. And um, Gary Brabin got himself sent off. Referee came over and went, off you go, son. We'll give you a red card instead. Um, he refused to leave the pitch. Uh, some of our stewards then had to manhandle him down the... The uh, the tunnel at York, which to be fair, I'm 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 not a big fella, but only I only I could just about squeeze down the tunnel. So the man handling down this tunnel, and Gary Brabin's then thrown one of the stewards to the floor, breaking his arm, which once again has started a massive melee. And I remember, I think his name was George Pilkington, uh, Luton's captain, who by the way, centre half, is about sixty yards on the other side of the 
field has come bombing across the pitch straight down the tunnel and he's getting involved now. So there was police in the tunnel. There's York, there's York stewards in the tunnel. There's substitutes in the tunnel, which is amazing how many people you can fit into that little sardine can. Um, and once again, completely instigated by Luton. Uh, yeah, we went up when we beat him. Did we beat him at home in the league? We beat him away. Uh, did we beat him at home? Can't remember now. I feel like we might have drawn. God knows. Then we obviously we met him again in the uh, in the playoff final, and the same level of animosity, same level of arrogance, same result. York City come away winners. Um, and it all came from that. Uh, <laughs> one of those like bittersweet, ironic moments of obviously how they their trajectory has gone gone all the way up and we're still loitering back in the, the in the National League. When we when we beat Luton in the playoff final, there was a York fan who'd made a a tombstone which said RIP Luton on it. And it somehow, no idea how, made its way onto the players open team bus. So there's lots of photos of Jason Walker at the front of this bus with a beer and this tombstone which says RIP Luton. Which kind of does stoke the fire a little bit. And Luton fans always remind York on a yearly basis of how they're in the Championship and we're still in the National League, which, you know, that's karma. I, I can take that. But um, there's a difference between having a cardboard tombstone and having a 50p lodged in the back of your head uh, in an away end whilst trying to get your dad out, of the, uh, trying to get your dad out of the away end, which was... Uh, an interesting afternoon. There's 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 banter and there's assault. There's a there's a bit of a difference. Um, so yeah, they started it. York finished it, but it came back to bite us on the arse anyway. So it didn't really matter in the end. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a weird one with Luton. Weird one because I don't, I don't think we're really rivals anymore. I just don't think we really particularly like each other. Um, we don't like Berry, but. Uh, once again, we haven't really played them in a while. I don't think we've been playing them anytime soon. So, yeah, Luton's a strange one, real strange one. I mean, just on that subject, how did you feel when you when all that happened with Barry? Then going on, going, you know, expelled from the league. What were your What were your thoughts? Couldn't happen to a nicer club. Simple as that. Couldn't happen to a nicer club. Once again. Um, they were mocking the demise of Blackpool I think it was when they played Blackpool in the league big yeah. banners saying RIP Blackpool and you know this that and the other Karma's a bitch Karma is a bitch um, <clears throat> obviously being being at Hallam and obviously playing the reincarnation of Berry twice this year I really 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 wanted to beat him so much but no, it's one of those things they beat us twice um, and and right and, and rightly so, I'd say the best team won on both occasions. To be honest, so I'm quite happy to sit here and say that Berry deserved it that day. Um, but the, the the original the original Berry, once again another another club a bit like Luton, just aggressive, angry fans. Like I can't, I, I don't know any Berry fans, but uh, I don't don't really want to know any Berry fans. But when I've when I've when I've gone there for away games, you just you just met with animosity. Now, you can go some places. We've been to, you know, like Leighton Orient, South End, uh, to name two, where York, York have had a fantastic relationship with them. And we've met up with their fans, we've had drinks, we've got their boozers, this, that, and the other. Uh, I've had South End lads come and stay in my gaff when uh, when they've played, you know, United and Wednesday in the past. Um, oh. So, you know, you know, I've, 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 it's, not that I, it's not that I don't like any other club apart from York and Hallam, because that's definitely not the case. Um, and there's always been there's always been um, you know relatively good banter with with you know with Mansfield even um, you know nothing to the same extent as Berry and uh, Berry and Luton uh, but the Berry thing goes back well into the eighties uh, well into the eighties so before my time uh, but once again yeah just a strange club and it, it sums it sums their fan base up that they had an opportunity to merge both Berry FC and AFC Berry together. You know, you've got a football club 
with a ground and no team. And you've got a football club with no ground, but quite a successful non-league team. So why don't you get them both together, work together, get both fan bases together and, and make make a community asset. Lo and behold, they didn't. You, you can't put brains where there aren't any. You, you, you just can't. Do you know what? That, that, that is actually a really good point because I've, I've been thinking all this time because I remember seeing the, the result and I saw him setting off fireworks thinking... Once again... Really? Uh, like I, I don't just I don't just make it up just to say I don't yeah, like Berry. That's a good point, yeah. Uh, like they, they, they had a fantastic opportunity to to get their football <clears> back, <throat> and they they should be much higher. They should still be in League Two, maybe League One. I think that's probably their limit of you know with fan base yeah. and money and ground. And same with York. I think you know I don't I don't I don't sit here and think York should be a Championship club because they shouldn't be. But I think that York could be a, a successful yo-yo club between League One and League Two. Um, and be a, a good community asset, and not at the moment, to be honest. Um, but yeah, Berry just Berry had a chance and threw it away, and uh, it's frustrating. As much as I don't like the club and I don't like the support, you know, football clubs can be fantastic community assets. And in a part of Manchester that isn't the most affluent and doesn't have much going for it, and they'll probably even say that themselves. It's not just me sticking the knife in. You know, having a community football club. And, and making it the hub of the community, uh, fan led like Chesterfield, like it can it can be done and it can be successful. Like Chesterfield's blueprint after having a, well, I, I don't I don't know the history of the club, but I know that they've had quite a few chairmen and owners that obviously didn't do the business and they ended up in in the national league and now they are um, owned by the fans, I believe. And obviously, I, I know they've got some backers who put money in, but it is still it is still pretty much run by supporters. So the model does work if you give it time and everyone buys into it. So it is frustrating that Berry fans couldn't do that. As much as I don't like the club, it is frustrating because the, the only people that are losing out <clears throat> are themselves. Yeah. Um, I couldn't care less if there's a Berry FC, but they can because it's their club, it's their community. So if they've got it, yeah. they're fantastic. Um, so it is. It is sad. It is sad to see. As much as, as like I said, as much as I don't really like them, it is. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because every community that thrives, usually, not say it has to be the case, but where there's where there's a good community spirit or where there's a good community sports club, then usually things are things are going well, um, both in socio economic terms and in and in sporting team in sporting terms. So sad to see. What happens to Gig Lane? <laughs> we could have all moved back home. Gig Lane still sits there. Someone cuts the grass and it stays there for forever in the day. Which is once again, it's as much as a as much as I've had some interesting times there. It's a lovely ground. It's a really nice ground. Uh, it's got a lot of tradition. It's big size. Um, it's got potential. The facilities are pretty decent. Location's not bad. Um, but yeah, just it's, it's just a shame, and it's a it's a waste. It's a waste, really. I don't really know where Berry AFC go because they can only ground share for so long. Now there becomes a point where they outgrow Radcliffe, Bur- uh, blah, blah, blah. Radcliffe Borough. Where did they go? Where did they move to? Who's going to have them? Um, where do, where did they go? Very good point. Where so, did they go? It's frustrating, but um. Poor management. It's put. It's, it's just. It's just poor. It's just poor management. Not on the field, but off it. And and York York were close. York were close to going that way. Um. Obviously, before back in two thousand and, and two three with John Bachelor, um, saved by the fans. Um. And then obviously we we instilled Jason McGill as chairman, which the going was good for a long long time. And as much as um, I certainly don't like where he took the club in the end. If it wasn't for him at the beginning, then we wouldn't have a football club. And up until you know, 2012, 13, 14, things were on the up. They were massively on the up. Um, then he completely lost a plot, to be honest. He completely lost a plot. The, the the structure of the club at the time was essentially the McGill family were the board. So you had Jason, who was chairman, his sister Sophie, and his dad, Rob. 
Um, and they had a, a massive falling out about the hiring of Jackie McNamara to be manager. So much so that his dad and sister left the club. And I think they were the ones who kept the lunatic in check because as soon as they'd gone, the club just became the circus that unfortunately it still is now. Um, yeah, he made mistakes the first the, the, our first time in, in the National League. Um, but he did an awful lot right, and he did put an awful lot of money in. And even even when things weren't going right, he was still ploughing money in. But just through mental decisions, ones where you just can't fathom, um, it just all went wrong. Um, there was no communication with the board and the fans. That's com- that completely went. That that recently came back again, but obviously. <laughs> Um, current events has meant that that's gone again. Um, but it, like I say, York's demise all kind of stemmed from the hiring of Jackie McNamara, unfortunately. Um, on paper, you know, played played a lot of games for Celtic, won a lot of trophies. Um, did okay, I think, in one season at one of the Dundee clubs. If you're a Dundee fan, don't shout at me because it was Dundee United, but I couldn't. The orange one. Um, yeah. And he came in and went for one of those strategies of getting young players from Premier League academies or Championship academies who just simply couldn't cut it. It's okay having one or two lone players in an, in an established side, but trying to rely on lone players who were... 17, 18, 19 in a big boys league. Um, when you've got four or five, obviously I know you can only have five, but you can you can see where I'm going. If five of your team are lone players and they're all 18, 19 year olds, you're weak. You're a yeah. weak side, both physically and mentally, yeah. physically and mentally. You don't know <clears> if you're coming or going. Um and the the, the player merry go round started, um, the results got worse and worse. Um it was at this point really where I kind of just, I didn't lose interest, but I, there were so many things going on off the field um, with, you know, players being offered contracts and then having them taken away, which, you know, if it's in the if it's in the Premier League or even Championship, League One, it, it, it doesn't really matter. But for players at York, that contract was their mortgage. And promising a contract and saying it in email, oh, yeah, you're going to get your contract, you're going to get a two-year deal, you're going to be on this, that and the other. We'll get the paperwork sorted. It'll be over to you next month. You think, fine, great. Next month comes. Ah, just working on the paperwork, working on the paperwork. Next month, still having to work on it, still working on it. And then near the end of the season, here's your contract. Well, this is a one-year contract and it's for six grand less than what you said. I can't, you know, we're trying to buy a house. We can't, we can't, you know, that's, that won't pay our mortgage. We're not going to get be able to get the house. Well, let's take it or leave it, I'm afraid. It's not out of it's not out of run businesses. It's not out of run football clubs, uh, and it was at this point where I was just losing all interest because football results matter. I, I know that, but I've been I've, I've seen York get relegated from the uh, from League Two before, albeit I was young. I've seen them lose at home to Northwich Victoria. I've seen them be bottom of the conference before, uh, and I never my, my support never wavered. But when you start messing with with people's lives and you start belittling volunteers and staff that have worked at the club for a long, long time. And I won't mention any names because it's just not fair, but, um, you know, programme sellers being told that the services aren't wanted anymore. That have been programme sellers for 15, 20 years. Um, just people being pushed out of the club, good people being pushed out of the club and being replaced by people who are just picking up a wage who have no interest in the football club. And you can see it happening. And you're thinking, this just isn't the football club. This isn't the community asset. This isn't what it should be. Um, results are one thing. We all like to win. Come on, we all love to win. Uh, but we're all sat here and neither, none of us are Man City fans. None of us are Man United fans. So clearly winning is only, only part of why we're football fans and why we support our local team and why we still go to non-league football. But see, if it's all about winning, then we won't turn up. We'd just watch, we'd just watch it on telly and just you know pick the favourite. Um, but when you see, when you see club stalwarts who've played for the club a long, long time and done a lot for the done a lot for the city, done a lot for the charities, um, 
it, it, out of her own pocket half the time. Um, it was really, really, it was sad to see and I just didn't want to see it anymore. So I pretty much just jacked it in. Um, not just York. I went, if it's not York, it's nobody. It was almost like one of those, you know, if I can't have you, then nobody will have one uh, moments where I just went, you know what? And I kind of sacked off football for a few years, probably about a good two years. Probably didn't even watch many games from about 2016 to 2018. Um, I, obviously, I was still, and I kind of said it to myself, I'll go back to York when, when Jason McGill sells the club. Um, and lo and behold, he only sold it last summer. So I've not been... I've not I've not been since apart from I went back at Christmas this year. It's my first time I went to a York home game since 2016. So um some can say, well, I've cut my nose off to spite my face, but I made that decision that I didn't want to give him any more of my money anymore. I'd had enough. Um and some of the stories, now this is where if you thought if you thought the stories before were funny, then this is this is where we're gonna like turn it up to eleven because when it when we got Jackie McNamara in, honestly, it just became a complete circus. So we got relegated from League Two, deservedly, yeah. no complaints. We were the worst team in the football league that year. So Jackie McNamara stays on, start of the next season, average results, and then we start tanking. And I mean, we really start tanking. Like we're losing to Geisley six one away. We lost at home to Geisley, I think four 0 um, you're thinking this this can't go on here, you know. Like we've got the we've got the biggest budget in the league, in the in the in the conference, and we're 24th. Can we maybe play some football? Um, and then once again, merry go around the players. I think that season, which would have been 2016-17, yeah. I think York used a, it was an obscene amount of players, even for like Hallam's level where players are non-contracts, you can go and yeah. come as you please. York that season had 64 players on the books at one point. Uh, well, not, 64? Not all, not all at once, but there were 64 players who played for York City that season. Wow. So there you go. Daft fact number one. So obviously the results aren't going very well. And Jackie McNamara says, well, if we don't win the next game, I'm off. And everyone's thinking, please, just oh, we get absolutely panned. Lo and behold, we draw nil-nil. He still resigns anyway. So we're thinking, fantastic. Now, this is where it gets really funny because he resigns as first team manager, but he installs himself as the interim manager. So still turned up in the dugout the next week. Just, yeah, okay. So that, but he had a strange relationship with Jason McGill, and I mean very strange. Um just bizarre, which we could talk about that relationship for hours. But never, tell me if I'm wrong, but have you ever heard of a football manager sacking himself, hiring himself, and then becoming CEO of York City Football Club? He became CEO of the football club he just sacked himself from. And, 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 and not, not only that, didn't he put himself in caretaker charge as well? And, and put himself in caretaker charge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the only so, one Gary told me, maybe, yeah. So, once again, we're all looking at each other going, don't, don't say, don't. Uh, once again, have you ever heard of any other football club do that? And then Jason McGill's, Jason McGill's on TalkSport backing it, and you're like, Jason, just shut up and get behind your rock. We haven't heard from you for about three years. This isn't the time to start talking. Just get behind that rock and stay there. Oh, and before that, a few months, a few months before in the press once we've been relegated out of the Football League again. Back of the press, Jason McGill, I need a million pounds off York fans to keep the club going. Not the right time, Jason, to be honest. Probably, pick your moments, just being relegated out of the Football League. Probably not your best time to come out with a statement like that. So anyway, he makes himself CEO. Well, he's hired as CEO, and then him and Jason bring back Gary Mills, who obviously got us promoted. Uh, and to be fair, this is just where this is where we get this is where the funny stuff starts, like really funny stuff. So I used to know some of the uh, some of the ground staff there, good guys, and they've gone on to be ground staff at much better run football clubs in York, and some have gone on to work in golf at good levels. Um, so one of them comes with a purchase order, and obviously purchase orders need to be signed off by the CEO at York. That seems like a, a reasonable way to do it. You know, the CEO needs to know what the cash flow is and what people are spending money on and what people are doing here. 
So in comes one of the ground staff with the purchase order. Gives it to Jackie McNamara and uh, says, just purchase order, gaffer. It's just uh, just for stuff for the pitch, seed, whatever. And he's like, what's this? I mean, it's, a, it's a purchase order. You know, it's, it's my stuff for the pitch. I buy it once a month. And I, I believe it because I wrote it from the horse's mouth. Apparently, he turned around to the ground staff and went, what's a purchase order? So once again, alarm bells are ringing. How can you be a CEO and not know what a purchase order is? Like, I'm pretty sure those three, unless they don't know what you're doing, yeah, your professional lives, but I'm pretty sure those three aren't CEOs, but we know what a purchase order is. Um, so once again, you're thinking, what a load of clowns. Same again, um, during, during the off-season between him being manager and getting his relegated out of League Two and... Um, this first season back in the back in the National League, uh, we had a player who was out of contract and he'd been approached by a team in the Scottish Premier League. And pretty much from what I've been told by the player, the deal was done. Um, and Jackie McNamara rang up and gave such a bad reference, which all I can think of is out of spite. The deal yeah. got cancelled. He, 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 he rang the club up. I think it might have been Hibs. I can't remember which, which club it was now. Um and gave this player such a bad uh, review and, and reference that the club uh, pulled the deal. Why? 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 Why do that? Um, it just it just smacks of you know nastiness and pettiness. Um, obviously, like I say, then we brought Gary Mills back. Um, and if you know about obviously, if you've got uh, mates at York fans, do you know the story about? Kuko Martinez's brother. Oh, go on. Right. So oh, it's, like York, it's like York City's non league Ali Dia moment. It's brilliant. Okay. So we signed a player from the Finnish third division called Derwin Martina, who has played a handful of games in the Finnish third division. And he's played some futsal as well. Brilliant, yep. fantastic. So we sign him and we've signed Cuco Martinez's brother. I'm like, okay, well, Cuco Martinez turned yep. up at Southampton. So you're thinking, hopefully, the gene pool was pretty strong. We might have an all right player here. Uh, we sign him. So it's, I forgot which day it was, but let's say we signed him on a Tuesday morning. We had a behind closed friendly Tuesday afternoon. We played 45 minutes. He was released after the game. And then it came out because one of the York press officers was able to speak to Southampton and sp and spoke to Cuco Martina and went, do you have any brothers by any chance? And they were like, no, no, I've not got any brothers. Why? Well, there's a fellow at York City who's claiming he's, uh, he's, he's your brother. He's like, no, 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 I don't have any brothers. Martina is a really, uh, a really popular name in Curacao, but no, I don't have any. I don't have any brothers. So, once again, fantastic. I don't know how many bottles of beer or wine were involved in that transfer dealing, but uh, what a fantastic F up from beginning to end. Only York could sign someone from Finland, once again, sort out all the travelling for the player, get him here, sort out all the paperwork, have him play 45 minutes and go, do you know what, son? <laughs> Just get out. Just get out. Same season where we had John Parkin, who I know has got a really successful podcast, which I just can't listen to because he's an absolute thief um, in terms of money uh, and his attitude towards the end of his career. Just absolutely stank. And granted, very good footballer, scored a lot of goals for York on his return. Um, but him and him, well, he was he was a catalyst for taking players out the night before a game. And there's one one in particular, uh, Dover away, where several of the first team went out with Parkin and got absolutely rat -arsed. Um, And one of them had to be substituted at half-time because he was that hungover. And this is professional football, professional football club. This isn't Amber and Pincers. This isn't, this isn't like Chuck E. Cheese, Rotherham Super League. It's, you know, it's, it's proper, premier, it's not, it's proper professional football. And we've got lads going out on the piss the night before. Um, and you know he sits and jokes about it on his own podcast and it really 
it really pisses me off because he was on good money, very good money, highest earner in that team. And he scored goals for fun because he could. He was a very good footballer. I'll never, I, I can't say that he wasn't. Um, but yeah, just took players out the night before games. And we wondered why, why we weren't bottom four. Well, ever turned up to work drunk? No. I did it once a long, long time ago and I never did it again. I can tell you that. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, whether you're a bin man, architect, doctor, footballer, you're not going to do very well if you turn up drunk. It doesn't matter what your profession is. Um, and the club just, it was one thing after another. Um, you know, York fans being um, abused by members of the, members of, uh, not the backroom staff as in the playing staff, but people who worked in the offices. There was one game where I think we'd, we'd lost in London, shock. And um, they were coming back on the train and a female member of the operational staff had had a few too many sherbet lemons and went down the train shouting and swearing at York fans, saying this, that and the other, calling them sea bombs amongst other things. Um <sighs> And the, the list the list goes on. The list goes on of just complete chronic mismanagement of that football club. Um and it just it just hurts. Oh, Jackie McNamara, I forgot about that one. <laughs> I've got another. Oh no, here we go. Right. In fact, <laughs> another one, another one of his signings. So Jackie McNamara once got arrested whilst he was either I think when he was CEO, he got arrested for fair dodging, which is absolutely who gets arrested for fair dodging. He was trying to get from York to Edinburgh and got arrested. Like just buy the damn ticket. Like who get <laughs> even if you're on the train, you know, and you haven't got the ticket, just buy it, mate. But no, he got arrested for fair dodging. Um, I think it was probably about the same time that he missed taking the first team training, so it must have been before he got sacked, maybe, and then hired himself again. Um, he, instead of taking training, went and bought himself a new car. But the only problem is, is the car dealership, obviously, must have been big Celtic fans and were really, really happy that Jackie McNamara had just bought a new Audi A4 from them. So put it up all over their social media and everyone went, hang on aren't you supposed to, it's a, it's a Thursday morning, aren't you supposed to be doing something? So I'm pretty sure you're paid to teach them idiots how to kick a football round occasionally. Um, he just didn't care. He just didn't care. Him and Simon Donnelly, um, his other little Scottish pixie, just didn't care. Um, obviously, uh, Jackie McNamara was not very well. I know he had a, a big, uh, I think he had a big stroke or a big heart attack, and you wouldn't wish that on anybody. So there's no, there's, there's, there's no animosity to that level, and I'd never, I'd never wish anybody ill, but I really wish he never steps foot inside York ever again because he's just not welcome. Um, it can go ruin someone else's football club if he wants to have a go. But yeah, happy days, Jackie McNamara. I'll give him a great reference. <laughs> Typical. Um, so, but it was it was, about, it was about this time where I just I'd I'd had enough. Uh, it was you know 2017, 18, and like I say, I didn't even watch football on telly at that time because I just I was sick of hearing these stories. I've just I've touched the tip of the iceberg with with stuff like that. There was a story every week. There's a there's a there's a banter era thread on Twitter, uh, which. Honestly, if you can find it, it's an absolute dream because I think I've taken about five or six out of a thread of probably 50, 60 of just just stories which, once again, you go, this could only happen to us. It could only happen to us. Um, and I, I, I just turned me back on football completely, really. I've just, got, I've just been so disinterested. And then um, Adam Maguire's big slabhead in Russia just got me falling back in love with football again. Um, I'd kind of been going up to watch Hallam very, very occasionally, maybe once a month, if, there, if 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 it worked out well with me being in Sheffield and if they were at home or something like that. And um, I went back up there and it was just night and day, night and day how welcoming it is at Sandy Gate and just all the volunteers are working out at the time. Uh, I'd never met any of them before, but they were saying hello, they were asking how I, how I am, what, you know, have I travelled far and oh, I'm just on the road and stuff like that, just... And you think this is nice. It's a nice, it's a nice environment to watch football. And obviously, I wasn't particularly bothered whether we won games back then because I was just 
just a fan just knocking about at Sandygate. Um, and then obviously after England's relatively successful 2018 uh, World Cup venture, I just messaged uh, I just messaged Hallam out of uh, out of interest because I'd done I'd done volunteering at York before. I'd been a ball boy. I'd been a, uh, a first aider. I'd been mascot. I'd done this. I'd done that. I'd cleaned the stands. I'd painted the longer stand as well. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd kind of done apart from managing play, which to be fair, I couldn't been any bloody worse. I'd pretty much done everything possible. Um, so I kind of said, look, I've. I've got a, I've got a decent skill set, I think, and I've kind of I've done it before. Um, do you want me? I'll do anything. I'll clean toilets. I'll sell raffle tickets. I'll do whatever you want. I'm not bothered. I just want to get involved. I just want to I just want to help a local club and kind of get back into football again. Um, and that's that I think I started selling raffle tickets at the start of the 2018-19 season. Did that. Sold a few programs. Um, and a few week few weeks or so about a month later, the lad who did the Twitter. Um, big Wednesday fan. I think he'd gone to watch Sheffield Wednesday, so asked me, "Can you can you do the Twitter?" I said, "Yeah, great." And I did it, and he uh, he never he never he never came back for the password. So I, I just uh, I just kept on I kept on doing the Twitter from there on, and then he messaged me saying, "Do you want to do the Instagram? Do you want the Facebook login?" And then it kind of it kind of fell on me to to run Hallam's social media, which it's been a it's been, it's been really really fulfilling. Out of all the things I've done in football, I think that as well as Kit Man and doing the program last year has been one of the one of the most joyous things I've probably done. Uh, it helps that we win we win games, obviously. But even when we even when we don't, you know, obviously this season, you know, we're in a bit of a transitional period from winning the league uh, last year, and it's obviously it's a it's a harder league, and there's some there's some very good sides in this league. Uh, I think. We might have even underestimated a few of the teams, to be honest. Um, and we've 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 lost a few. We're mid table, but it's still the, the love hasn't changed at all. Like I say, results are only part of the whole picture. And being a custodian of you know the, the world's second oldest football club and being a caretaker of the world's oldest football ground, like just to say that is brilliant. And it, I, I do feel a big. Uh, there was a big sense of pride being able to be one of the select few who do that, um, because it's it's not just the history of Sheffield; it's the history of the world. Is how MFC and making sure that Sandy Gate is there for for you, me, you know, our kids, our grandkids, um, and for for generations long after we've all bothered off, uh, it needs to be there forever. And if if I can help during my short period of of time here in the club, then um, uh, then it's a success story for me. Well, yeah, uh, that's what I mean when you look at it. It's the second oldest football club in the world as well. It's got quite a lot of history behind it. So you've actually chose quite a quite a big club in Ironside. Yeah, yeah. And, it, club, yeah. And, and and I chose it out of complete fluke because I have, I have to say, even though I'd lived, I'd lived, I moved to Sheffield in 2011, and I only went up there in for the first time in 2017. I didn't even know it was the world's oldest football club. Uh, sorry, world's oldest ground. I didn't even know it was the world's second oldest football club until I really got there and went, oh bloody hell, this is pretty good, isn't it? And then obviously, like most people who go watch Hallam, they're, they're back again next week. It seems to have this weird seductive pull. Where everyone just seems to come back, whether it's in a fan capacity or a volunteer capacity or playing capacity, just once you've been once or you've got involved, it seems like you're stuck forever. <laughs> yeah, it, to be fair, like I do need to get back up to Sandy Sandy um, Lane. It's been a while. Oh, sorry, Sandy Gate, Sandy Lane's round corner at the minute. Been there enough <laughs> yeah. times, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's sort of one of them. You're always feeling welcome. I know, I know quite a lot of people as well who work for Hallam, and like you said, it's just such a welcoming club. Yeah, and it's it is really really good, and that to have so so many sort of non league football clubs in the, around the area of Sheffield, but you've got probably two of the most historic ones as well, Sheffield FC and Hallam FC. So. If you, if one of those goes and that that rivalry and um, the world's 
all this derby goes. It's it's part it of his. It would be well, a travesty. It would be a yeah. massive travesty. And and to be fair, it's it's for people like us three to keep banging the drum about not just non-league football in general, but people in Sheffield or you know we don't seem to shout from the rooftops and say how amazing we are like people from Manchester and London seem to do, or specifically people from Leeds. Um, but we've got some amazing, you know, like USPs here for football, you know, and. I, I think there needs to be a football museum in Sheffield. I've always said this. You know, the world's oldest clubs here, the second oldest clubs here, the old, the world's oldest football ground is here. The world's oldest club competition was here. The cup is still here. Um, I got to say, as well, the world's fourth oldest club is just round the corner. It yeah. is exactly, yeah. And you know, there's it's, we we need to, we need to tell people about this, and we need to get it out there because. You no, know, and, and quite rightly, I don't I don't particularly like people who shout from the rooftops and say how amazing they are. Uh, but I think on this occasion, people from Sheffield and Sheffield Council, um and and and, and all this on all the shareholders, all the stakeholders who are involved in football around here, we need to we we need to be louder and prouder of what we've got around here because it's not like anything else. Like coming from York, you are you are the you know. Obviously, you know, you've got Leeds and this, that, and the other. But in York, there's, there's York, there's York City. There's no real non-league football. There's, obviously, there's the Sunday league and there is Saturday, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoons. But there's no semi-pro teams until you get to Selby. Um, who obviously win the league below Hallam. But there's nothing. But round here, you know, Maltby, Parkgate, Sheffield FC, Stocksbridge, Hallam. You know, the list goes on. You know, like even clubs like Dinnington on the way up who've just had a new facility put in, fantastic, it's great. And like I keep banging on about community assets. Yeah. Like the people of Dinnington have clearly got their heads screwed on and made a decent facility, which is for the people of Dinnington. Um, I'm just trying to think, you know, you, you look you look at who Hallam played last year and you look at... Answorth. 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 Give it in. This, exactly. This exactly. There's, there's, so, there's so many. Now, I, I appreciate that Sheffield is substantially bigger than York but you know in comparison York should maybe have one or two but Sheffield seems to have an abundance um, and just look at the attendances you know like if you if you added them all up from all the non-league games you've pretty much got York's attendance if you if you added up Sheffield FC Hallam um Stocks, Bridge, Hansworth, Stocks, yeah. Stocks, If you if you added them all up, if you added them, obviously they never all play on a Saturday together. But if you were to pick, you know, a, an array of games, stick all the uh, attendances together, you've probably got a, a, a national league or a national league north attendance, and that's just to watch. And I'm probably doing home a disservice, but it is. You've got to remember, it's step nine football, and there's a thousand people rocking up. There's, you know, we averaged. I think it was over 600 fans last year. It was something like 682 or something like that. I can't remember the figure off the top of my head. But it's that's ridiculous. It's silly. That was for Step 10 football. You know, we got over 1,000 three times. It's it's bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. This year, we've got over 1,000 twice. Once for Berry in the FA Cup and once for Hansworth uh, over Christmas. Um which is mental. You look at clubs like Alfreton who, are, who have been much higher and Hallam's attendance, his, his average attendance is double some of their own games. And it's, step, I'll keep saying it, it's step nine football. They're not very good. You know, like, it's, 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 it's step nine football and people still love it. People love the atmosphere. Like, they love that you can drink in the stands because I, I think that, I think within reason that can be brought back if police properly and stewards are, and stewards do it right. I think it is possible. You know, we still have terraces. Uh, safe standing is once again coming back. Um, so I think that's that's a massive step forward. You know, we let dogs in of the canine variety. You know, so that that brings people in. Um, you know, families love it. You know, we've got big we've got big open spaces. You know, your kids can kind of run around, go a bit mad for a bit. Um, you know, we've 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 we pride on ourselves on making it an inclusive club for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, who you're with, you can come along, you'll be greeted with a smile. 
Hopefully you'll see a good game of football. And most of the time, even if it's win, lose or draw, the Hallam games are pretty decent. I think my favourite game of last season is actually one that Hallam lost when we lost 5-4 to Parkgate because it was just the maddest game of the season. It had all four weathers, um, sorry, all four seasons, just great goals, crap goals, last-minute drama. It was mental. I think Hallam were 3-1 down, came back to be 4-3 up and then long beyond lost 5-4. It was just, it was mental, but it was brilliant. It's a fiver. It's a fiver. You can drink in the stand. What more do you want? It's, but then once again, the food's decent. It's all relatively priced. Um, you know, Hallam do have a massive, like I said before, they, they do have a massive unique selling point that, you know, do you want to buy a shirt from the world's oldest ground or do you want to buy a shirt from, no disrespect, Maltby, Maine? Who's going to go? Who's going, to, who's, who's, who's going to buy a home shirt from Maltby Main? I'm sure there's people out there. So um, there must be someone who's bought a Maltby shirt somewhere. Um, but, you know, Hallam have that unique selling point and we are making stuff of it. You know, we've, we did the Reverend and the Makers shirt, the collab last year. This year, we've we've got a third kit, which was in the cup competitions, which was the, as we call it, the Inter Hallam uh, kit because it looks absolutely stunning. I remember pulling it out of the kit bag for the first time and having to take some photos going, my oh, God, that's beautiful. Um, but just everything about it, on a match day, we're selling £750 worth of merchandise on a, on a, on average on a match day. So, uh, you know, Fantastic. It's, it's it's unbelievable. Like, it, it, it still does surprise us. But we obviously have a good product and people love what we're doing and people come back. And it, like I keep saying, it's an inclusive, it's an inclusive community asset. You know, we have birthday parties there. Um, you know, we've had funerals there. Well, not funerals, we have wakes there. Um, you know, we open it up for events. We had all the England games on um, for the World Cup. It's, we've started opening the bar as, as an actual bar on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which has been able, once again, great community asset, getting people in, getting people through the door. Um and that's that's what football clubs it doesn't matter what level that's what they should be. Um, the door of a community football club should always be open. It has to be. If if it, if if a, if the club is to be viable at any level uh, and be relevant, then it has to be the heart, the beating heart of the community. Um, and that's unfortunately where York are failing at the moment. And I think that's why they've got so many problems. And I, I really do believe that. Which if you look if you look at how they run and you look at the affinity between club and fans, it's just not there. But there's so much potential at York. Like when I was watching them, you'd be looking at you'd be looking at between two and a half thousand and three thousand as an average attendance. This year, you know, we're we're not doing particularly great on the pitch, but we've moved to a new ground and we're averaging five and a half, six thousand. I don't know where they've come from because who was watching that? It's dreadful football. I went on Boxing Day. I wanted to stick needles in my eyes. But they're coming out of the woodwork somewhere and it's a club that's poorly run on and off the pitch at the moment. So it shows just the potential of what that club could do and what the club could be in better hands. Because the current chairman that we've sold it to seems just as loopy as the last one, unfortunately. Um I, I thought, well, once again, the, I don't know if you've seen it recently, but he obviously bought the club from the Supports Trust. The Supports Trust kind of said, well, you have 51% of the club, we'll have 49 so you're still technically in charge. But the contract was much more uh, in our favour than the previous one. Um, and obviously the results haven't gone particularly well. He sacked a very, very popular manager, which turned the club and the fans against him overnight. Um and then he decided, right, I've had enough, I'm going to sell up, which is fine. That's fine. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your money. Well, well let's let's find a buyer. Let's get you out. No hard feelings. It's not worked out. And then he says that he he, he, he went on um he went on BBC Radio York and said uh, oh it was just uh, it was a momentary <clears throat> lapse of judgment and that he's not selling the club. Well, a moment, momentary lapse of judgment would be me swearing at you now. That's a momentary lapse of judgment, which happens in the heat of the moment, and I apologise for it. His momentary lapse of judgment was over three days, making his solicitors get all the paperwork sorted, sending it across to the York City Supporters Trust, have them sign it, send it back, have him sign it, and send it back to the Supporters Trust. That's not a momentary lapse. That's a very much, you know, a conscious effort where you had many, many, you had many times to turn back and you didn't. 
So lo and behold, all the paperwork is signed. Um, my dad is on the supporters trust. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I believe him. Um, he's an idiot, but I believe him. Um, so now he's turned around and gone, that's not the case. I can have a club back, blah, blah, blah. The club will see him in court. The supporters trust will see him in court because the, as, as the statements from the supporters trust have said, they've, they've got all the paperwork signed by him and they are contractually obliged to go out and find a buyer for the price that they have agreed. And let's hope they do. And let's hope that the next one is better than the last two. Um, because when he came in, once again, he, he had a he had a good start. He was able to get the fans on board and he, he did bring some good initiatives in. But it, it soon turned sour. Maybe it's the fans. Maybe it's us. Maybe we're the problem. I don't know. Um, I'd like to think that we're not because every time that something goes wrong, like with every football club, it's the fans that are always there to pick up the pieces. And it seems all the time that York fans are picking up the pieces. And it has been for far too long. Um, and it just, and like I say, although it's a very different beast, York City and Hallam, it just shows how, how much a successful club on and off the pitch can change a community and how much of an asset it can be and how people want to use it um, if it's run correctly. Um, which I'd like to think Hallam is. And I'd like to think that one day York would be. Um, it's just it's just really disheartening and really frustrating. Um, but th- thankfully, I don't really have much to do with it because I'm absolutely loving life at Hallam. So... Uh, you just add on to that. You have to just add on to that, mate. Something I've never seen before, and again, this might be another one of them York moments you talk about, but I've never, ever oh, no. seen a manager get sacked and go on the radio to talk about it. I thought that was very insightful, really, and brilliant to break rank like that. Well, well, once, 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 once again, because do you know what? Um, obviously, John Askey and Glenn Anderson, Glenn Anderson being the, the current chairman, um, John Askey being the, uh, the, the, the sacked manager, it, it showed just how much John Askey cared because what, everything I yeah. said... I believe that John Askey bought into what I was saying, that he wanted it to be a community club and we needed this and we needed that. And we were slowly, slowly. I, no, no York fan in their right mind expected York to be top of the conference when you've got Wrexham, Notts County and Chesterfield. There's absolutely no way that York, in their current predicament financially, you know, we've just come out of the National League North and by the way, we were very lucky to get out of the National League North because we finished 32 points behind Gateshead and still went up which is completely yeah. unheard of. You find me another football club that finished 32 points behind the team that finished first who got promoted. Because I, I, I don't think there is. I don't think there is. So we were very lucky to go up. Very lucky. Uh, a bit of a fluke and a good run of games. That's what got us up. Um, now, the results weren't going well under Askey near the end. But I think he deserved, and, and he deserved more time and he deserved more respect than what he got. If the way that he was sacked... Is true from what he said, you know, where he's been called in and it's he's, he's found it on a fax machine and it's, um, it's as, essentially said, see you later. Um, and, and the communication is broken down between him and the chairman, um, which it did because the chairman came on Radio York a few weeks previous saying how we had one of the best budgets in the league and we had a team that was only good enough for the Northern Premier. It just stay to, stay, stay to being a chairman. And, and let the managers manage. And you get to make the decision whether you want to get rid of the manager or not. But don't go on the radio and start pretending you're a football manager because you're not. Because you, you're just not. You're a chairman. You've had very successful businesses before and you've made an awful lot of money. So you, you, you clearly have a good business. You have a business mind. And uh, it's, it's not like it, not like that uh, absolute charlatan at Scunthorpe who's clearly got no money. Yeah. Um, he has made some money and he's, he's been successful. There's no doubt about that, and I won't ever argue about that because he is. He's a successful businessman. But you're not a football manager. So in the politest terms, piss off. Get Stay in the boardroom, and if you're not happy with the results, then you can discuss it with him in the boardroom between you and him. Don't go on the radio and start calling him a pig to a dog and calling out, oh, well, this player's rubbish, this player's rubbish, he's on that, he's on that. It's, it's embarrassing. But once again, lo and behold, York City, how many managers do you know come out literally the day after they've been sacked to get their side of the story across to the fans. Yeah, you, you, so, you, you, don't, you don't see it very often. All right. Certain managers walk away and think, well, they don't want me to buy that. I'll take my services elsewhere. But can I just say another thing as well? You know, I, you touched on there, but 
these, these leagues, the National League, League Two, National League North, it takes a good run of games and you're in it, just like that. 100%. Would, it say, would it be fair to say, at one point last season, do you think after you lost, was it 3-0 to Bradford Park Avenue at home, do you think that was York City's rock bottom? And you still managed to recover from that. Would you say that's rock bottom? At, well, not rock bottom, but one of the very the, the biggest lows. That probably, probably, probably. That one, um, that because you mentioned losing Northwich, Northwich Victoria at home. I well, there's another one, Bradford Park Avenue. The, the Northwich Victoria one's slightly different because Northwich Victoria yeah. was still in the National League. But I yeah. remember we were about three or four games from the end of the season. We needed to win some games, and we just yeah. about stayed up, but. North, which were dead and buried, they were rubbish. And I mean, they were rubbish. And um, we got beat 2-1 at home. And it, in my mind, like I say, that was... I, I'm not there to comment on the games of the last few seasons, because obviously with Jason McGill be, not being there, I've watched from afar and I've seen the results coming in. It's every single week, like, Jesus, they've lost again. And then you think, this has to be the lowest point. And then, lo and behold... Next week's the lowest point. They just seem to want they, they, they you always they flatter to deceive themselves. You think they can't get any lower. That this is the lowest ebb. And then there's another lowest ebb and another lowest ebb. I'd say for me, watching with my own eyes, I'd probably say the Northridge Victoria loss at home was was my personal lowest. Um because back back then. I was so invested in the football club. I, I just, I, I couldn't see life without it. Thankfully, I've grown up a bit and I do other things on weekends and I've, I've got a life outside of Boone and Crescent and I don't go to Abbey Hay away to watch the youth team on a Wednesday night like I used to. Um, but I'd say, I'd say getting probably relegated out of the National League was probably the lowest point. Um, that way you do Forest Green. Two, yeah. Two, that one. yeah, yeah, yeah. When it was just eerily silent, I remember watching yeah. it on BT Sport, watching from afar, and just wanting somehow for them to stay up. And I, I remember just thinking, "This is the end." Uh, I, I didn't think they'd survive financially, still being full time in in National League North because we never went part time. And that's what what I touched upon earlier. Jason McGill put an awful lot of his money into that football club. And I, I'll never, I'll never not say that he didn't, but he was so misguided and made so many poor decisions uh, and hired the wrong people, not just managers, but people around him uh, in the boardroom and in other areas of the football club. And then obviously, you no, know, his communication and breaking down with the fans and well, the animosity, the animosity both ways, because I don't think he particularly likes us and we didn't particularly like him. Um, but I think, I think the lowest ebb. Well, I say that was the lowest ebb. But then again, losing in the national league, uh, losing in the national league north. I remember it was a bit of a dead rubber game. I think, uh, I think they might have been near the bottom of the table. It was FC United of Manchester. One of my mates went, "Come on, it's the away game. We'll we'll go." And I said, "I went, go on, and I'll drive. Buy us a ticket, and I'll drive." And we went to we went to watch FC United of Manchester versus York City. Uh, a Mickey Mouse team that was a protest club, or still is a protest club, against a team that's beaten Arsenal in the FA Cup. Beat Man United uh, in you know, the FA Cup. Beat, 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 <laughs> beat, Man, beat Man United in the League Cup. Yeah. Um, Paul Barnes, what a player. Um, but uh, just the players, the attitude, the fans, just everything was just so disjointed. And being there, I was thinking, it'd been, it was my first game I've been to in a while. Um. I remember just looking around thinking, like, what is what has happened? Like, how has it how has it come to this? Um, but I just think that sometimes hopefully they turn the corner and they did it under John Askey, so I hope that it can continue under the current management, although the judgment for me is still still reserved. Um we seem to just have such a toxic atmosphere, not just in the stands, but just in the club as a whole. So many players that came to that have come to York over the last five six years during this dark period, who have been absolute bobbins, and then gone on and been brilliant at other clubs. And you think, well, maybe we are the problem. Maybe the maybe there's, there's, there has to be something wrong because it could, it can't happen this often. And something in the DNA of the club. You think? Yeah. There's something in the DNA in the club. There's there's yeah. something there's something 
fundamentally wrong with how this club is run. Yeah. Uh, the amount of players that we've signed and done nothing or come on on loan and have been dreadful. Example, Bailey Peacock Farrell came on loan for York for two games, shipped in 10 goals. He's now played in Premier League. You know, I, I, but he came to York and was dreadful. And there's lads that we've signed permanently. And you're thinking, well, they're rubbish. Like, but then you can't, but then we have so many players, they can't all be rubbish. They can't all be that bad. Because they've gone on, many of them have gone on to play in the Football League or play in the National League for better teams or go here, go there, go everywhere. And we're still slumbering the National League North. Obviously, it's a few years ago, but you know, you're thinking it, it, we have to be the problem, whether it's fans um, not being on board anymore, uh, whether it's the actual the facilities or how the clubs run. But it goes it goes back to everything. Like football is a business. Everything's a business. You know, if you if you have a paper company and your boss, you don't get on with your boss, and your boss hasn't got a relationship with you. Uh, he doesn't see the workers, uh, slags you off on the radio or does whatever uh, publicly. And you, you hear about that. Uh, and the facilities that you're working in aren't the best. Uh, when I say aren't the best, are dreadful. Um, mm-hmm. you, you're not going to perform at your best. But if there's, a rival paper, if there's a rival paper company who go, look, we can't offer you any more money, but the toilets work. Um you know, uh, you, you'll have a, you'll have a better, you'll enjoy your job better here. <clears throat> Do you want to come and have a look? You're gonna go, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you're not, you'd be, you'd be daft not to. So, as much as I think some of the players think it's maybe an easy ride at York sometimes, uh, and have seen us coming over the last few years, I think there's part of it where it's just been a, it, it must it. I, I like to say for the last few years, it's very much been an outsider looking in and hearing the horror stories and hearing this and hearing that. But it's clearly not been a nice place to work. And footballers, at the end of the day, that's their profession. And if it's not a nice place to work, you ain't going to do your job very well, whether you're shuffling paper or playing football. Um, and that's the same even at, at Hallam's level. You can see that, you know, with the results that we got last year, the lads loved playing at Hallam. Um, and I'd like to think that the lads at the moment still love playing at Hallam. Um, because they get treated so well. So well, I think they get treated yeah. too well, to be honest. You know, when you go to when you go to some other clubs and you see, and this is no disrespect to any of the clubs in our league or in the league in the league last year. When you look at the facilities that Hallam have and the food that gets put on for the players after the games and the way that they're treated, uh, and the, the things that we do for the players when the, when when players have newborns, we get them little Hallam FC baby grows and we make sure that they've got everything that they need. That they need. Um, if you know if players ever need anything, then you know there's there's volunteers at the club which would do anything to try and help them. Um, you know, before a game, they've got free access to teas, coffees, cakes, whatever. Same after the game, you know, there's plenty of food on. Uh, and you go to other clubs, and it's and uh, I'm not naming names because it's just not fair. Because obviously, some clubs just don't have the facilities that we do, and don't have the don't have the same amount of volunteers. So it's not nice and not right to name other clubs. But the facilities and aren't there. The welcome's not as nice. The food's not as great. You know, it's just it's not the it's not that happy environment that we've created at Hallam. Um, and it, the, I'm sure that if you had any other players on, I know you had Ollie Fearing on, but I don't think was Ollie Fearing at Hallam when you interviewed him. I can't remember. Um, he was at Osset. Was he still at Osset? Yes. At yeah, time? he finished at Liverpool and then yeah, he's at Osset now. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I imagine if you had him back on, uh, I know you've had massive on. I know you've had Ryan Ainley on. I'm sure he had enough yeah. to say about Alan when he was on. Oh, yeah. I've, I've 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 not got six hours of my day to listen to that one, so I might have to I might have to take a day off work to listen to that one. But I'm sure, in your car, away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm sure he would say the same that you know it's yeah. it's such a special club. Um, you know, he he wasn't as he, he was he didn't get the he was he was very successful at Hallam, but didn't quite do he didn't quite get us over the line in the same way that that, that Craig has the same way Dents and his uh, and his team has. Um, but he he was he start he, he got the ball rolling, uh, and yeah. I'm sure he I'm, and I'm sure he said an awful lot of nice things to say about Steve Bassford and people who were running the club when he was manager. Uh, and how it is, uh, it is a league above in terms of the people behind the scenes and what what happens on a match day and non match day um, to try and to, to try and help the manager, to try and help the players, and try and help the club grow. Um, 
So I'm, I say, and that's the same. You know, it's the same at our level. But you know, granted, it's it's step nine, like we say. But if it's a nice place to come and play football, even just at this level, if people like playing there, people like the dressing room, people like the atmosphere, you're going to get better results. You're going to get better players. And if you get better results and you get better players, because you know, you've got a good atmosphere, it snowballs because people go, look what Alamo got over there. Look at that, that was pretty decent. I will not mind playing over there. And then you get a few more players in, you might, you might win a few more games and they go, bloody hell, it's decent here. And then it snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. And that's why, if you look at Holland's attendances, the first year that I helped there, um, we had that target 200, hashtag target 200, to try and get an average of 200 fans uh, through the door. And that was 2018-19. We're now in 22-23, and we're averaging almost 700. Like, it is a, it is a huge increase. And it and it and it comes from the atmosphere and the volunteers, the committee, all pulling in the same direction, and everybody has the same goal. And that they're just trying to make the football club better. Every every decision that we make, you know, we make wrong decisions um, <clears throat> on and off the pitch. Uh, you know, I'm on the committee as well, and you know, we sometimes don't quite get it right, but we always make that decision thinking of the best interests of Hallam Football Club. Sometimes we, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but everything we do, it doesn't have an ulterior motive. We're just doing it to try and make the football club better. Um, now, obviously, I, I don't I don't think other football clubs, not just York, obviously we could talk about Scunthorpe, for example, another prime example, where things and decisions uh, are, are, are made and they're not, they're not in the best interest of the football club. And that's why that's why they're bottom of the table. It's why they've got a wind up order because people have, you know, clung onto that football club and been biting chunks out of it and doing this and doing that and taking this, taking that. And it's never been for the benefit of Scunthorpe United. It's always been for the benefit of themselves. Um, and it's the same. It's the same at, at Hallam's level. You can see you. Can, it's obviously you know which clubs. You can see which clubs have, have to a certain extent or to a lesser extent have the same happen to them. Um, and it's it's sad to see, but you know, there's only so many volunteers, and unfortunately, they can't be everywhere all at once. So absolutely not. No, but how far can Hallam go? Fantastic <laughs> last season. In Where terms, far can they go? I think in their current setup, um, I think we could get promoted again. I don't think this season, yeah. Um, but the jump from Northern Counties to Northern Premier, whether you're in the East, yeah, Midlands or wherever, um, the jump to the next league is is, is another. If, if we thought the jump from Northern Counties one to Premier League is big, yeah. the, the next one's mon- the, the next one's monumental. There's an awful lot more travelling. There's yep. some big, there's some bigger clubs, uh, yep. which you, you 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 expect that going further up the league, um. But we need we'd need it we'd need better infrastructure, um. Irre- irrelevant of the playing side and trying to get three points, we 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 would have to try and really ramp up what we do off the pitch, uh. To try and make what we, we, I think we're great at what we are what we're doing at the moment and what we are, but when you look at the the setup that, for example, works up town have. Compared to what Hallam have, it's it's night and day. Hallam are never going to have what Worksop have, because you can't just put a four G pitch on Sandy Gay. I don't think the cricket club would be partic- would be particularly pleased. You'd have to level, but it, it, you, you'd you'd ruin what Sandy Gate is if you yeah. if you start doing that. There is there is room to to grow Sandy Gate. Obviously, uh, to be in the league that we're in now, we've had to extend the shed end. Uh, that now runs behind the, all the way to the corner ball. It runs so far behind the. Top goal. Uh, we have other we have other uh, development ideas to take that <clears throat> to the actual corner flag um, and proper try and tear that as a terrace uh, all the way along, which would be decent. Uh, yeah. Then obviously we can try and put a roof on it at the bottom end. We can try and do bits and bobs. Um, obviously, we've in in the last 12 to 18 months we've we've got another a, a cam bar and and snap cabin at the bottom end of the ground because obviously. Anne's cabin is right in the middle of everything. It's just it just gets so rammed. Um, one thing we have to look at is probably get get more toilets, but it's 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 a massive massive investment for just even one of these things. Um, and although the club is run sustainably, 
um, it's not making profit, but it's not making a loss. But to 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 do these things, you need to be making profit to pay for the damn things. So it's going to have to be you know one project at a time, whether it's fundraising or if we've had a good few months or if the bar has been open in the summer like it has been for the last few years and we've got all the picnic tables out and we have a good summer and we're able to rake some money in, then potential can go, right, well, which of these projects is the top one on our priority? Which one do we want to do next? And we do that one. And it might mean that we have another league, another season in NCL Prem and then we do something else. It means, right, well, that means next year we're in NCL Prem. That's fine. And do bit by bit by bit in the same way that when Ryan Hindley was here and um, when you had uh, Scott Bates and, and and that lot before Dents, you know, it was, it was a gradual progression of getting the team better, getting the team better, getting the facilities better, getting the facilities better. And then, you know, not, not taking away from Dent, uh, Dents or his boys' achievements because it's been fantastic what they did last year. Um, and no other, I don't think any other Hallam team will ever reach the heights that they did last year in terms of goal scored or, you know, goal difference, amount of wins, just points, uh, points total. It was, it was unbelievable. It, I don't think it'll ever, ever, ever happen again. I don't think it'll ever happen again. So we've kind of always, we've, 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 we've we have that up there, like a, a peak. There's going to be some troughs. There's going to, there's going to be some coming because you can't get 102 points every single season. That's just, you know, you're not going to, unless you're playing FIFA or whatever, it's just not going to happen. Um, so we need to, if if we were to go higher and, and and try and stay higher, then we'd need to almost have a five year plan. I hate saying that because that idiot at QPR said that, and then it kind of got coined. But we would need to say, right, well, this is our plan. We're gonna next next summer we're gonna extend the shed in, and then you know the football will sort itself out. Year after we're gonna look at putting a new toilet block in, and then year after. We're going to look at floodlights because the floodlights need changing at some point so that they stay up to standard, um, which is going to be a, a, a monumental cost to the football club. And we've known it's been coming for years and we're trying to save, try, pardon me, trying to save. So we know that the money's there because the floodlights that we've got, the, but they don't make the bulbs anymore. They're still in stock. But at one one time we're going to ring up and they're going to go, there's no more bulbs left, mate. And then we'll, have to, we'll be scratching our heads and working out what we're going to do so at one point we're going to have to change yeah. LED lights like everybody else is doing because it's you know it's more environmentally efficient it's cheaper for us and well it's the future uh, the LED yeah. floodlights is the future but you know if you've got 60 or grand knocking about and you fancy giving it to us so we can put some floodlights in and I'm sure we'd be more than happy to take that money off your hands but you know, it's 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 a big it's a big undertaking for the football club. Yes, we can get grants for part of it and this, that, and the other, but there's still a big chunk of money which the football club needs to fund itself. Um, and like I keep saying, you know, we are a sustainable football club. We haven't got someone just flying money in like you see at this level, uh, or even a few levels above. You see, we see it now and again in Northern Premier. I see it in the NCL where you can see that someone's having a bit of a vanity project and just gone, you know, what, sod this. I'm going to put some money into my local football club and you see players, ex-Premier League players coming in and playing for £500 a game and probably play about four games and piss off again. But you, you, you know what I mean? You know, some, of, some, some of the teams that have won the leagues in the, in the last few years who you know, have, been, have been heavily funded um, and had attendances of 120, well, I can tell you now, knowing what Howland's attendances are and knowing that we are you know, breaking even. Sometimes we lose some money, sometimes we'll have a better month the month after. How and make an awful lot more money than these other football clubs. <laughs> so they're definitely being bankrolled by someone. Like we don't have to be we don't have to sugarcoat it because they're being bankrolled by somebody. Uh and if that person walks away, then there's only one way the club's gonna go. And that's not what we're trying to do at Hallam because it me it means too much. It like like go, going full circle. It's the old it's the oldest ground in the world. And we can't just have it as someone's vanity project where they get us into the... Let's just go stupid and say, we're going to get to the National League North. We get to the National League North and they're ploughing in 10, 15 grand a week to keep the club going. And then they go, I've had enough now. Because you ain't going to find someone else with 10, 15 grand willing to put it into Howland FC. You're not. You're not going to find one. And you're going to come down them leagues an awful lot quicker than the way you went up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, North Ferriby, for example. Prime example. <laughs> Prime example. Um, 
granted that they're a bigger club than the northern than, than the northern counties. They should be in yeah. the northern premier echelons. Maybe, yeah. maybe if they have a good few years, maybe National League North and and yo yo between them two. Um, yeah. But flying them up the leagues and getting them into the National League, it was only ever going to end one way, and it ended the way everybody knew it would. Yeah. Uh, and once again, who who kicked the can for it in the end? Fans, as always. Um, I'd love to know what I'd love to know what their fans would think. Would they do it? Would 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 were they happy with the way it was? Would they go through it all again, lose the football club, and start again for the years they had? I don't know. I'm not a North Ferriby fan, and I've 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 not got any association with them, so I wouldn't know. But if you offered me that over what Hallam have, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take it. If you offered me all the way. if you offered me three years, three years of promotion back to back, but then you didn't offer me any certainty for the next ten years, I wouldn't take it. No, not a chance in hell. If you said that how am I going to stay in the league they're in for the next twenty five years, I'd cheat around. I'd cheat around and walk off. I'd take the deal right now because it meant the club is still in still in existence, still at a good level, and it's still hopefully part of the community. Um, because that's like I said before, and I keep, I keep going around in circles to a certain extent. I'm a, I'm a custodian of the world's oldest football ground, and as long as I'm involved with Hallam FC, my main aim is to make sure that that football club is still there next week, and the week after that, and the year after that, and the year after that, the decade after that, because it's so important for the city, so important for football that this stays where it is, um, and it, and that we don't move, and that the club's always here. Um, because if the club if the club went, it would be it would be a travesty. Not many people would probably care at the time, but then it's one of those things where you don't realise what you've got until it's gone. A few years down the line, when when the world's oldest football ground isn't in Sheffield anymore, you know, I'd I'd love to know what the uh, what the what the shops in Crosspool think about Hallam being successful because I'm pretty sure that Hudson's Kitchen gets a few more people coming in for sandwiches when you when the Hallam are at home. I'm I sure just, that I was so, just about to touch on there, mate, as well. Like you know, walking past the ground not being there, you think because you know on the way down to Brackley away, that yeah. was the day that the uh, diggers were on Brooth and Crescent and they got passed around. You know what the fans went? Who when they went? Get it away from me! Get it away from me! Yeah, yeah, it's awful. It hurts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I went back a few times to Bootham Crescent before they got the uh, before yeah. they got the bulldozers on it, and then I went back stupidly halfway through and looked through the gates, and it. I'm not gonna lie, I did cry because I, yeah. I, I, I dread to think how many hours of my life I've spent in there, and like I say, not just not just watching football, you know, painting the stands because once again the the club. <sighs> The club put every roadblock up and still puts roadblocks up to stop fans being fans. Now, I appreciate we can't have flares in and we're not going to have Tifosi like a curve of Nord and we can't start having, you know, pulleys off the roof of the Longhurst and uh, making it like, you know, Lazio. I appreciate that. You're not going to get that in the UK. But back in like 2004 to 2010 when the Orbit Reds uh, were a fan group and doing they were doing they were doing TIFO and doing flag displays long before Crystal Palace's lot were doing it. Long before Crystal Palace's lot were doing it. Um and they did it away games, they did it at home games and I've I I, I helped them out. I've done plenty of work with with them. And then obviously when the when the Yorvik Reds disbanded and a new foot a new group came together called We Are York, I ended up being one of the the admins for that and helped push it forward. Uh, I helped do fu- I, I helped do fundraisers so that we got you know a budget every year to do flag displays, which is mental. Um, you know we'd go out and buy plumber's pipe and then we'd have my mum sewing stuff and it, honestly it was like a when whenever we did big new banners if we signed a player or like when Nigel Worthington became manager we had a I spent about a week off uni in my room on Stalkerley's Road with about 16 metres of blue paper and 16 metres of red paper to make two great big banners, one that said, thanks, Gary Mills, and one that said, welcome, Nigel. And then I'd, then one of my mates came across and picked me up and we ferried him back in his little, uh, you know, his little Astra. And then we went, got to my mum and dad's because that's where the, the, the plumbing pipe was and then we had to fit it in and tailor it all together and then take him down to the club. 
And the amount of the amount of resistance that we got from the football club and the people that work there to go, what are you doing this for? You're not allowed this. You can't do this. You can't do that. We're ban we're banning we're banning your flags next week because someone got hit on the head with a bag of confetti. I'm like, what? Really? Uh, yeah, it's against it's against health and safety to have confetti. I'm like, but it's not though, is it? Like, it's not. Like, find me the legislation where you're telling me that that's the, that that that's the case. Um, Oh, you can't put in your banners up anymore because it's pulling the paint off. I went, you haven't painted it in years. You've not painted the banners, the crash barriers in the longest in five, six seasons. It were more of just... a damage to pulling paints off than they are. <laughs> and, you know, and any excuse to make us not do it. And we're just trying to help the football club. We're trying to create an atmosphere. We're trying to make something special for the city. Not just for us, for the football club, but for the city. And like I say, prime example, yeah, you can't put any of your banners up on the on the crash barriers anymore because you're pulling the paint off. Well, well, give us the paint then. You've not painted it in years. I know that they didn't pay for the paint because a York fan donated paint to do it. And they went, oh, oh no, no, I'm not sure if that's the case or not. I knew it was the case because I knew the fellow who donated the paint to do it in the first place, but the club couldn't be arsed doing it. So I, went, I know you've got the paint, so let us paint it. And then if our tape pulls the paint off, whose paint's it pulling off? Ours. So if we make a mess of it, we'll come back and paint it the year after. And, you know, two weeks before the season starts, painted the full David Longer stand on multiple occasions. Before playoff games, you know, maybe not going to uni, maybe not going to sixth form or whatever it was at the time, and putting pieces of card on every single chair in the main stand, every single seat in the, in the pop stand. Um, only to meet resistance from your own football club. We played Fleetwood. Granted, it's not non-league. We played Fleetwood in the um, in the League Two playoff semi-final, and live on Sky Sports, like they all are. Uh, Tuesday night game, I think it was, and the heavens opened. They opened at like twelve o'clock for like six hours. Everybody's in. Like the place was rocking. I'd I'd never known noise like it, but. They, they they called it off with about an hour before kickoff because they just couldn't play it. It was getting worse and worse and worse. And um, obviously we went home and I was going down the next morning to tidy up to make sure to, to, to reset it for whenever the game was going to be played. I think they ended up playing it about two or three days later. And um, once again, office staff come out you need to tidy all this shit up. It's an absolute disgrace. You've left it a mess. We've done this, we've done that. And they were picking it up and ripping up all of our hard work and throwing it in skips and throwing it in the bin. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need, like, I'll salvage what I can, thank you very much. And they've thrown it all away and they've done this and done that and hid this, hid that. And um, just like I say, just putting roadblocks up to stop you at every turn. Um, every, everything you could possibly think of, every trick in the book, the amount of times I'd get called into the football club to have a meeting with the with the uh, with the safety officer saying, "Game's up, you can't do it anymore. Tell me why." And you can't. He, he couldn't tell me why. Like, why? What? Why? What's your agenda against me? Is it? Is it me? Because if it's me, I'll just someone else will take it on. Because if it's me, I'll just walk away and someone else will have a crack at it. But you could never give me an answer. And the amount of times in the summer where we'd get called in to have a chat over someone's behaviour, over this, over that. And they're blaming me for fans' behaviour. You, 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 you organise the stewards. If your stewards can't handle the fans, then that's your fault. I'm not. I don't. I don't take control of fans. I don't tell fans what to do. That's you know. That's that's your remit. Your your head of security. You're running the. You're running the gaff. So you, how about you sort that? I'll I'll do what I do, and you do what you do. Um. And that, that 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 carried on that carried on for years. A long time, even after I I jacked it in, and other people took it on. I know they still got resistance from the club, um, but they're very they're more than happy to use uh, our flag displays on all their promotional stuff to try and sell season tickets and say, oh look look at this fan display, look at the flags, look at this, look at that. Aren't our fans great? Yeah, our fans are great. Yeah, but the fans have paid for all these flags out of their own budget, and you're trying to confiscate them. But when it's your agenda, then you're more than happy to put it on on your Facebook page, and you're more than happy to put it on the Instagram, and it's you're more than happy to use me waving a flag, big massive, uh, great massive flag, and put it on the uh, on season ticket cards. Well, you can't have it both ways, then. You can't have it both ways. It don't work. <clears throat> no, I don't just don't work. Well, 
I'm, I'm sure I've I've got I've got a good friend who's an Oxford fan, and they they've had they've had similar problems with with their you know um, group doing flag displays, doing this, doing that, and they've had an awful lot of issues. I think they've got them resolved now. So I know that York, for once, aren't the only club that have that problem. Um, but clubs cl- clubs love to show these great atmospheric pictures with all this colour, but will but love to clamp down on it at the same time and say you can't do this and you can't do that, which is frustrating, really frustrating. And they, it seems it seems to happen in York more than anywhere else, to be honest. But uh, I've said that before this evening. <laughs> Honestly. Like I look, I, I do still love the club to death. Obviously, my dad's are my dad's on the board of the supporters trust, and uh, every Saturday, although we don't go to the football together as much anymore, he still comes to watch Harlem. I, I occasionally watch York with him. Um, you know, it's still the same Saturday afternoon, probably about quarter past five. My phone will be going, and my dad will be telling me everything that's happened at a York game. Uh, give me a match report, and I'll do him the same for the Harlem game. Because the love's still there. The love will never go. Uh, I just think the football club that I have the love for probably doesn't exist anymore. Uh, well, I know it doesn't exist anymore. After going back on Boxing Day to the new ground for the first time, I, I know that that ground uh, doesn't exist. And uh, I think that club in general doesn't exist anymore. Um, like I said at the start, it's uh, it's bittersweet, but I still, I've still had some unbelievable memories from uh, from being there. And I wouldn't change it for the world. I would not change it for the world. Um, I just hope that the new generation, you know, the, the 14 year olds who were like me when who were like me when I was 14, uh, can really get behind that club. And you know, for Boxing Day, they got beat by Gateshead and were dreadful, got beat 3-0 at home by Gateshead, but there was you know six and a half thousand there. So people people are wanting that club to succeed. And um I really hope for their sake and I really hope for the people that are involved now um, that that is the case because they, they genuinely deserve it. York fans deserve not just success on the pitch, but they just need to have a nice peaceful life for a few years without nothing crazy happening. Just give it, give them 12 months of nothing happening, of no promotion, no relegation, no scandals or anything stupid happening off the pitch. They just want an, they just want a well-run football club that is the heart and soul of the community. That's all they want. Well, at least that's what I think they want anyway. Absolutely. Well, so let's let's wrap up season three with the question that we ask everybody. And that is can you sum up football in three words? Uh, three is... separate words or three word phrase. What would you say? Um mad cold. Addictive. <laughs> Mad and cold. I don't think we've heard those two before. Very, a new two words to add to the list. Well, if anyone's been to, if anyone's ever come to watch Hallam, it doesn't matter if they're watching us on the first of August. It's bloody freezing up there, and it's cut. We, we we lifted we lifted the trophy <clears throat> on our last home game of the season, and it snowed. It snowed when we were lifting the trophy, so it says it all. We started in perfect sunshine. And then people are putting big coats on when we're lifting the trophy because there's snow in. So yeah, mad, mad, mad cold and addictive. It gets, it gets us all angry, and then we do it all again on the Tuesday night or the next Saturday, don't we? So yeah, yep. Well, oh. I I must say, I've 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 really enjoyed some of the stories. Some yeah, of the stories I've not heard before, which is great for to share. Maybe a part two with Hallam. Because I'm sure you you've got quite a lot of stories what you could share about Hallam. By, by all means, I'll, I'll wear a different shirt for the Hallam one. I can uh, I can bring out my Hallam selection. So yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, but for me again, thank you for coming on and it's been great to hear your stories. Uh, you you're both more than welcome. I'd be more than happy to come on and just uh, just kind of uh, dedicate one to Hallam and uh, the stories about Hallam and yeah, because um, it's. It's it's a like we've like we've touched on. It's a sensational club, and uh, it'd be good. Uh, it'd be good just to have one, just uh, just solely focusing on them. Yeah, and hopefully you never know. Matt can see you there as well at one point. Well, hundred percent. You're more than welcome. If you're ever going to come up, just let me know, and I'm sure we can get something sorted out. So yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I must warn you though, mate. I've been to Sandgate four times, and Helen have lost all four. 
And the, with last season's being uh, Rossington main in the cup at home. Oh, but that's... <laughs> I, 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 that's one, yeah, I, I'd advise you just to not come and watch us versus Rossington main because we always seem to lose against Rossington main. <laughs> so... Come come to come to the Ferby rearrange on game. We like beating them there, so you can come to that one. <laughs> yeah. And that right. is season three. Finito. We'll see you next time for season four, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>